Uh, many of us here have enjoyed listening to Scott Craven on Larry Mueller's show over the years. And um, you know, over the years, I always enjoyed how enthusiastic Scott was. God, he's got to be a young guy with all that energy and all that. <laughs> Ten or twelve years ago, I, when I first actually met him, I said, geez, he's not so young. <laughs> and then I got, I got a little bit spooked uh, when he said he's going to retire. And, uh, you know, we are going to miss him on the radio. Well, fortunately, he's still there every other month, and he's got great alternatives in the in between months when he's off doing other things. Um, Ann and I attended a Natural Resources uh, Foundation field trip on small mammals up near Minocqua um, a year ago. A little bit, uh, well, okay, a year ago or so. And when we were there, Scott uh, was doing the small mammals and he had help from Jamie Mack and David Drake, who are his alternate uh, Egos on the uh, off months, and they're really good. They they worked on this workshop. It was great. I asked Scott if he'd be willing to do a small mammals program for us because it was on our list of things we wanted to do, and he said, yeah, and it took a long time to get him pinned down and, and get a date, but uh, uh, we've got him here. While we were there, though, I wanted to give a sales talk here. Uh, we found out about the... Uh, Coverts program. That's what this shirt is all about. It's a program uh, that's run by the folks uh, from uh, Forest and Wildlife Ecology in Madison uh, for landowners who have timberlands or woodlands and they want to do some management for wildlife. Uh, Ann and I applied. We were accepted to attend this workshop uh, last summer and it was really great. Uh, um, Jamie and um, David and Scott did teaching. There were other people that were involved with it. In addition to which, Scott is the chief cook for the whole thing, and he's a wonderful cook. <laughs> on top of that, he got his bachelor's degree from New Hampshire, where he's from, master's and PhD from UW-Madison. Uh, he's emeritus professor of wildlife ecology there, and we all know him Larry Mueller anyhow. Let's bring Scott on. Here, here. Some of these animals are incredibly abundant, and some are incredibly important. So that's what we're going to do. Um, the next general issue is maybe to just kind of come up with a working definition of what's a small mammal. It's not like a bread box situation, bigger or smaller than a bread box. It's actually a determination of animals that truly are small. So. Here's one here that fits the criteria for size, but is it a small mammal? It's not. What is it? <laughs> it is a marsupial. Could you be more specific? <laughs> it's, a, it's a baby possum. So the fact of the matter is that all of these, all of these things, including bears and everything else, starts out quite tiny at some point in their life. <laughs> That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about animals that remain small, this size or smaller, as their adult life. So that's where we're at. And they're not all mice. They're actually quite a few different groups. I have reasonable images of all of them, but whether we'll get to them or not is questionable. I'm notorious for starting a PowerPoint, of which there are many on that flash drive. We, we had six of them loaded up this afternoon. I never showed one image. <laughs> we, got, we got tied up with snakes and assorted other things, and hey, everything went pretty smoothly. But uh, between the specimens and some other things, you'll, you'll leave tonight with at least a cursory familiarity with, with most of these animals. And I'm talking about, yes, there are mice. There are also some of the smaller squirrels, shrews, moles, field rodents that I mentioned, and then the bats, and a couple other things mixed in, and we'll take those as we go along. So we can establish, or you can establish, just a big crowd, so we can't go through these one by one or talk to each of you individually, but I will offer for your
viewing consideration my quiz board. <laughs> so I'm just going to slowly walk around the room and you scan this. And if anybody can identify all ten of them for me, <laughs> and there's a new car waiting as approaching. <laughs> we did this at the Garden Expo last weekend in Madison, and I couldn't find anybody that could identify more than two of them. But these are all common small mammals in the state. Maybe not all common statewide, but all fairly common critters. So you just look at them and, you know, okay, so you pick out one or two that you think you've seen before or that the cat's dragged in or whatever. <laughs> but I think you'll probably look at that and say, well, holy shit, what's that big fat thing in the end? Or what are those little things that all look like mice but aren't? And so on. Okay? This particular board, um, of the various things I've done over almost 40 years now, affiliated with the university, being on the Larry Mueller program has been one of the most rewarding. Being involved with this coverts project is also close to the top. But sitting at my workbench one afternoon about 35 years ago, thinking, well, here's a nice piece of 1 by 12. If I put some small mammals on here so we could show these to people at Farm Technology Days, maybe that would attract some attention. Well, <laughs> this little thing has been incredibly popular, uh, to the point that my colleagues, the aforementioned David and Jamie, won't let me bring it out anymore <laughs> at large group events because everybody, what is that? What's that? I saw that or whatever, and you can't get anything else done. <laughs> but it does serve the purpose that there's a bit of diversity here. The different groups, except for bats, are all represented. And now that you've had a brief chance to look at it, let's see what you collectively can up with. And if between the whole bunch of you, you can identify all ten, and you'll have to share the car. <laughs> Let's make it easy. And, Let's make it easy and see what this. Which chipmunk is it? Easter. It is an Easter chipmunk. There are two chipmunks in the state, so bear with me here. There's some other hidden agenda here. There are two chipmunks, all right? And this, team line ground squirrel, commonly referred to as a striped gopher, although it's not a gopher. That's another problem dealing with these things is that common names confound the situation even more. There are three ground squirrels that we might talk about. How about the silvery guy here? Which mole? <laughs> Not a star nose mole, it's the other one. That's the common mole. Star nose mole would be number two mole. So you, you get the, begin to get the feel that there's, yeah, these are representatives, but there are other species. How about this fat little stubby tail thing it's right here? That's a meadow bowl. Yes, it is a meadow bowl. Are there other moles? Six of them. What about this little guy? Red dead bull. This one? Is it? Short-tailed shrew. There are six of those. How about this guy? Now that is a mouse. <laughs> but which one? Like a white footed? It, it could be a white footed mouse or deer mouse. There are three species in that genus, and they're very difficult to separate without doing some measuring. So there's three of those. And then this miserable thing on the end, house mouse. Exotic species, it'd be nice to rid the country of them, but that's not going to happen. Going the other way, what about this reddish colored thing here? Franklin's ground squirrel. Yeah, it's a Plano rat. Plano gorgon rat, so it's an unusual coloration. But realize, too, in addition to the variation in species, size, and all that, there's color variation in these things, just like there is in the hair color of the audience, for those of us who still have. How about this little fuzzy thing? Flying squirrel. Which one? It is a southern flying squirrel. There are two, southern and northern. We'll talk about that a little later. But how about this little thing here on the end? Pocket gopher? It is a gopher. That's a pocket gopher. Okay. So what we have represented here, one, three, some four, five, six, nine, eleven, seventeen, 23, 26, 27 different species of these guys. And when you throw in our eight 
bats, there's your 35. Or half of Wisconsin's fauna, mammalian fauna, made up of small mammals. You need a larger hunk of lumber. I need more lumber. <laughs> <laughs> but the specimens are getting hard to find, so this was, this was a one-shot deal. <laughs> anyway, that gives you some idea of, of what the diversity is amongst what species. All right, so <clears throat> I'm not going to say, well, we might as well dispense with this right now. As far as the bats are concerned, and there are eight of those, as I said, some are very common, some are quite rare, um, but bats have their own suite of problems right now. As you probably know, the white nose syndrome has finally made its way to Wisconsin. No one knows what the impact will be. We, unlike many of the eastern states, had time to get ready for it. So protocols are in place to protect some of the hibernacular in caves and deal with the people who visit those types of sites. Maybe that will help mitigate some of the impact. Maybe it won't. Only time will tell. But white nose syndrome is a huge threat. As a result, there's been a whole suite of new regulations dealing with bats that affect everything from how you might handle a bat colony in your attic to how you might manage your bat houses or a whole host of other things. So there have been more protections extended to the animal, animals, and then more recently there's been a lot of publicity associated with additional protection for the long-eared bat, which has changed a lot of forestry. Well, I say a lot. The impact is yet to be determined too, but there are regulations now that affect the forestry, forestry practices and timber harvest because those particular bats are tree bats and there are some provisions in place to protect them. So there's lots going on in the world of bats that are interesting, but they're worthy. I'd be surprised if you haven't had some sort of a bat program in recent times as far as this group is concerned. Therefore, I'm going to dispense with them for tonight's activity to say, hey, yes, they're out there. They're very important. They've, compared to when I started, 1972, uh, and earlier than that. Uh, at that point, bats were still lumped almost with snakes as being the two groups of creatures that if you happen to bring them up in a public setting, oh, bats, I don't want to hear about those. And then with the, through the efforts of people like Merlin Tuttle and Bat Conservation International and so forth, they turned the corner and they're as popular as any species group uh, I could come up with now in terms of people being both interested in trying to do something to help serve their populations. So unless there are specific questions about bats, it's a once, twice, third, and last call. Bats are now out of the mix for tonight. <laughs> so the next question we might address is, so there's 35 of these things out there, 27, give or take a couple, um, not counting the bats. Why, why be concerned? You know, I understand people are concerned about the black bear population or what's the deer herd doing prior to the hunting season and so on and so forth, but so what? When it comes to these little furry things scurrying around in the grass or leaves, what, what's, the, uh, what's the attraction? Why be concerned? Or why be interested? Mm -hmm. Any they're, thoughts? They're an important part of the food chain. A very important part of the food chain. They're generally at the bottom of the food chain, with the exception of one we'll talk about in just a moment. So they're important in that regard. Uh, a number of our species either reach the southern end of their northern distribution or the northern end of their southern distribution here in Wisconsin. So I think some of them will prove to be important barometers for movements or shifts in species range lines with impacts like climate change. They're important in seed dispersal soil aeration, prey species that we've already talked about, and you're kind of missing the elephant in the room here. What about human interactions with them? Good, bad, or indifferent? Often what? Bad. Often bad. Uh, a lot of these animals cause us quite a bit of grief. The two so-called commensal rodents, the Norway rat and the house mouse, both exotic, both almost the word commensal means association with humans, so they're almost always found in close association with people. You're not going to be wandering around in the north woods or out in the middle of a big tract of open land and in all likelihood run into Norway rats or house mice. 
The other species, yes, but not those two. But those two alone are responsible for, uh, I've seen figures of estimates for the rats, for example, 20% of the world's food supply is contaminated or destroyed by rats and other species of rats worldwide on an annual basis. And all sorts of disease implications and other problems. So there's no question that they're important. But in terms of your backyard or under your refrigerator or in your garage or what have you, some of these things turn up with disturbing frequency. Yeah. And people are forced to deal with them. And there are a variety of ways. I'm not going to belabor the damage control or nuisance management strategies, but if there are questions about that, we can talk about it. But for me, I'm supposed to know about these things, and I constantly berated my every time a white footed mouse shows up in the house, either the dogs are chasing it around or it's chewed up something in the basement door. My wife starts in on me. You talk to people all over the state about this, and you can't keep them out of your own house. <laughs> and, oh, you are keeping this, aren't you? <laughs> you mind striking the last 30 seconds. <laughs> but, but they can be a very annoying problem in a whole variety of situations for the homeowner or in your yard, but for commercial operations in the state, the meadow bowl that you correctly identified. Huge problem in Christmas tree plantations, in orchards, especially with dwarf fruit trees, whether they're the two you've got in the backyard or somebody's got thousands of them. I, many years ago, I ran into a Christmas tree grower at a convention from Black River Falls area, and he attributed losses in one season. The previous year was bad for bowls. He estimated he lost 50,000 trees for bowl damage. I mean, you, you know what a sheer Christmas tree brings on the open market these days, that's a pretty significant loss. So they can be a big problem. So one of the reasons for concern is the, the downside. There are many ecological reasons why they should be of interest. But the, re the real reality for me is these little guys are just as interesting as the bears and the deer and the elk and everything else. On a daily basis, they're out there doing the same things that a deer or a black bear is doing whether it's finding food, finding a mate, trying to avoid being eaten, run over, or whatever else, or finding shelter, they're all in the game together. But these are right under your feet. They can be caught. They can be stuck in a terrarium and observe them for a couple of days before you let them go. They're accessible to you, or to your kids or grandkids or the scout group you work with or whatever else. They're interesting little things to pay some notice to. And most of the animals on that board, uh, with the exception of the pocket gopher, I'd be pretty surprised if you live on the edge of town somewhere, or even in town, near any green space at all. I'd be surprised if every one of those things isn't within 50 meters of your back door at any given time. And yet you just don't see them very often. The, uh, the one I was going to mention um, that has a little more practical is the, uh, did I bring the blue rhino? Is the short-tailed shrew. Mm -hmm. Lorina brevicata. Brevicata in Latin means short tail. So sometimes the scientific names are helpful. If you see them in keys or learn to use them, they avoid the problem of the common name issue, which varies from place to place. Anyway, short-tailed shrew is my personal favorite sport mammal. Um, I catch them occasionally in the garage. I feel buyer's remorse about that because they're only in the garage because they're in there to eat the white-footed mice that are bothering my wife. <laughs> so if I have a shrew in the traps as bycatch, I feel guilty about that. But on the other hand, I've had enough of uh, enough experience with them in, in the classroom and whatnot to uh, appreciate the fact that they're venomous. So amongst all these animals, well, amongst all mammals on the continent, basically, it's the only venomous mammal so they have venomous saliva uh, because the shrews, along with the moles, are not rodents. A lot of these things are rodents. Those two groups are not. They're insectivores. And I'll show you their teeth in a bit. They're a very impressive set of teeth. And in the case of the short-tailed shrew, they eat small rodents, among other things. They eat lots of other things, too. But they subdue voles and mice that are as big or bigger than they are with the assistance of that venomous saliva. 
So then that raises the question, oh my God, now he's told us that in addition to being a nuisance in the house, they're venomous, now what will I do? <laughs> the reality of the situation is I suspect there have been lots of cats and dogs and sometimes people who exhibit some strange symptoms of pain or whatnot that by the time anybody even thinks that it might have been attributed to a sure bite, the symptoms have passed. And um, I don't know about the pet situation, but let me read you just a couple lines from this account. <coughs> as I read my eyes. So this was an account from the Journal of Mammalogy in 1973. Some effects of the bite of the short-tailed shrew. I'll paraphrase this in the interest of time. So this individual was running a trap line in southern Minnesota. On the 29th of November, they captured a short-tailed shrew while holding the animal by the scruff of the neck. Big mistake. <laughs> to examine it, it turned inside its skin and bit me near the base of the thumbnail. I immediately released my hold and pulled the shrew off by the scruff of the neck with my right hand, whereupon it turned again and bit me <laughs> Almost immediately, within 10 seconds, both thumbs became very painful. The smarting was followed by a numbness and a tingling sensation around the bites, which spread onto the backs of both thumbs. Bites occurred at 2.30. At 3.30, the numbness was present. It was moving up my right forearm. The next day, the symptoms still appeared to be spreading. The right side of my chest and abdomen were somewhat sore, and the swelling and soreness in my right hand had spread so that the thumb, index, and middle fingers were not functional. My appetite was depressed and I was quite drowsy. A day later, I felt well enough to drive the car around the trap line but could do no walking. Hand was still painful and too weak for heavy work. Two days later, symptoms had disappeared. Being bitten by a blurina is not life-threatening, but in this case, it was a little painful. So I thought that was pretty cool, actually. So uh, <laughs> a few years later in the lab, we had a couple of them in a five-gallon bucket. Oh, no. One of the grad students was messing around with them. And I warned, I said, Dick, don't mess with those shrews. But he knew what he was doing, sort of, to a point. But he kept messing around with them. And pretty soon, he brought his hand up out of the bucket, and the shrew was dangling from his index finger. Oh. Same deal. He grabbed the shrew and pried it loose. But before he could release it, it had it by the middle finger. <laughs> <laughs> this time he threw it back in the bucket. He was muttering all kinds of unkind things about shrews. The blood was running down his hand. I said, listen, this is really great. I said, go home and call me every few hours. And let me know. <laughs> <laughs> he continued muttering, but he did go home and he did call me. And when he finally called the next morning, so I woke up this morning, tried to turn off the alarm clock, but my hand was completely paralyzed. I really couldn't use very much of my arm. And later that afternoon, things were subsiding and he was in pretty good shape. But you know, here's just a, another practical example of why it pays to know a little more about these things than just dismissing every small furry thing as some kind of damn mouse. Okay? So I guess we've made the case there and of their importance. The next issue is, okay, so I said there's a whole bunch of these things, roughly 30 of them. How the heck do you tell them apart? So the general principle here is really the same as it would be for identifying anything you might find, from a frog to a snake to a turtle to a small mammal. You may not have it in your hand like this, but if you get a chance to observe anything, you, you have to train your mind's eye to, in, in sometimes only an instant, capture as much about the animal as you can ranging from size to color to overall form to some of the many things that in the case of this common mole, Scalopus aquaticus, the name there doesn't help any at all because aquaticus refers to water and these animals are not found around water. So you look at an animal like that and, and what kinds of things can you call out that seem pretty noteworthy about that animal? First thing are the shovel-like front feet, big front feet. Can you see his eyes? Well, good for you. <laughs> Generally speaking, well, how about ears? Any luck with ears? The ears and eyes, because of their lifestyle, are minimized. They do have eyes, and they can 
seed, but they're hidden in the fur. They have functional ears too. What they lack is this part of the ear, the pinna. Well, this really is the ear. The functioning ear is inside there. This just collects sound and gets it into the ear. But if a mole like this had an ear like this, what would it do for it? Collect dirt. Collect dirt. <laughs> the, the point being, when you start to look at any of these little guys as a bit of a package, and if you pried its mouth open and looked at its dentition, you'd see that it doesn't have typical rodent-like teeth that we'll talk about in a minute, but rather it's got quite an impressive set of sharp little teeth, which, which would suggest something about its diet. The shovel-like feet suggest that, hey, it's a pretty good digger. What, the, what a sorry excuse for a tail. In fact, you can hardly tell which end is the tail and which end is the nose. But again, when you start to put all the pieces together, all of a sudden you come up with a pretty good picture of where and how this animal must live, and therefore, with the aid of either a good field guide or the internet, identifying what the heck it is should not be a big problem. It's a common mole. Do they carry rabies? Generally speaking, this, any mammal can get rabies, but it's not usually a big problem with small mammals or rodents. There are other things to look at. So, not a big deal coming up with the identification of a common mole. Similar size and shaped animal, dark chocolate, uh, not dark chocolate, dark charcoal gray, longer tail, and a really bizarre nose little fleshy tentacles on it. That's the close relative of common mole, the star nose mole, a really bizarre animal. These are generally found in primarily the southern two-thirds of the state where there's good soil depth and the soil is continued so it will hold the burrow rather than collapsing, rather than further north where soils tend to be thin. Star nose mole, on the other hand, is a more northern animal and generally found in damp or moist areas and they spend a fair bit of their time underwater. Whereas this one does not. So once you've figured what these things are out that you're coming in contact with, either through your own deductive powers or the use of a couple of resources, there are numerous keys available to help you sort these out. Did I cut them here? This one is aha, Wisconsin rodents. And here we have rats, mice, voles, and lemmings. These, these are just examples. Um, there are 30 or 40 copies here. If you'd like one, take one. If you're a couple, take one. Pass them around, see how far they go. But basically, basically the way these things work, and it's the same for any species group, there are a series of choices to make. A series of pairs or couplets, like the proverbial, is it bigger or smaller than the red box? If it's bigger than a bread box, you go to a certain pair. If it's smaller, you go to a different pair. And if you continue to make the right choices, you will end up with the proper identification. Well, the dichotomous teeth are the basis of biological and taxonomy. And there are a couple different versions there. There are many of them that are readily accessible in field guides or on the internet. So you can see what they look like and, and go from there. That's one alternative. Another alternative, when you find these things, of course, the internet is helpful. If, for example, you find something that captured, I think this might be a shrew, and you go to Google Images for a short-tailed shrew, you'll very quickly have 500 pictures of a short-tailed shrew, and you can figure out what you've got. Uh, the other alternatives include taking your specimen or a picture of it, and of course now with everybody carrying a smartphone, it's pretty easy to snap a picture of something and text it to the local nature center, museum on campus, or whatever, and get an identification for you. But there are also many field guides which will help you sort out who these little guys are. If you have the whole animal, that's one thing. You may only have parts. You may find a piece of an animal. You may find a skull. You may find tracks. That's where this, one of my favorite field books, uh, Elbrock's Mammal Tracks and Sign. This is a companion piece for birds, and there's another one on skulls. Really beautifully done books, nicely illustrated in color, and it'll run through any conceivable mammal sign that you might find. And by that I mean tracks, nests, 
prey remains, droppings, you name it, it's going to be in here. And if you do a little detective work, and that's really what you become in these identifications as a wildlife detective, then you can sort it all out. Okay? All right, so that covers a little bit of the basic identification. And, and the sign, one of the most common issues with sign that comes up with small mammals deals with, since about half of these are actually rodents, the, the first, one of the first clues, especially if you have the dead animal, is to just look at the front teeth. Anytime you see those big paired incisors, these two right here, you know you're dealing with some type of a rodent. You might find a reasonably small skull that's a little tricky, just to be on the safe side, whenever you look at those big incisors, look behind them. If there's an extra little peg-like pair, just a little tiny second set of incisor teeth, then it's a lagomorph, a rabbit. And those can be, especially young ones, fairly small as well. But for the most part, you see those big teeth, rodent. There are sets of measurements attributed to the adult form of most of these rodents. So when you find something like the aforementioned Christmas tree grower, and bulls are particularly fond of Scott's pine, less popular now than it was, but this is what bulls can do to the trunk of a Scott's pine. And if you don't know what, oh my god, look what happened to my pine trees, if you look closely at the edges of the gnawing or the actual gnawed surface itself, you can see little paired grooves. You'll see that on a tree a porcupine's chewed on, you'll see it where squirrels are working on your siding or your window trim, you'll see it on things like this. You can actually measure those little grooves, and then compare them to the measurements of rodent teeth in a book like Elbrox, and again, come up with a pretty reasonable assessment of who done it, <laughs> even though all you have is the damage. So, it, it, uh, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that there are reasons why, if you're interested in these things, you, you take the time to learn a little bit of the terminology or jargon involved in them in terms of skull or tooth parts, in terms of the droppings or sign, or in terms of the kinds of things you'd see in a key, and then you can figure it all out. Okay. Um, the other type of sign, and one of the, uh, one of the most <coughs> interesting problems that I used to have repeatedly, of course, droppings. But these are small animals. The droppings, it's not like a big pile of bear scat like somebody got the blueberry pie on <laughs> these, are, these are tiny little things. And finding the droppings are also, these can be very distinctive. Now, these happen to be, well, I don't want to tell you that at the moment. If I took some of these out, crumbled them up on a piece of white paper, and you looked at them with a magnifying lens, what you'd see are little tiny bug parts. Bug feet, bug eyebrows, bug toenails, whatever. All the indigestible parts of a bug. So these are bat droppings. And yet, constantly had people come in, coming into the office or calling me and saying, oh, there's droppings all over my porch. And I've got 50 mouse traps out there and I'm not catching any. <laughs> because they're not mouse droppings. <laughs> mouse droppings are very finely ground and processed plant material. They're hard. They're pointed at both ends, these are blunt. Again, you invest a little bit of time to figure out what the right answer is to these things. You can solve, you save yourself the world of hurt when it comes to trying to capture, control, or eliminate these things. Okay. On the subject of catching them, one of the relatively few things that people designed over the years that have stood the test of time <laughs> it's a pretty simple design, but they're pretty effective. Uh, the newer ones that have like big pieces of plastic cheese on them and whatnot, try and avoid those if you can. The old ones with a normal trigger that you can modify with a little piece of cloth. Just a tiny piece with a twist tie, and you can smear your peanut butter into the cloth. On a warm day, the animals will lick the peanut butter right off the trigger, you won't catch anything. That little bit of cloth, you get a tug for that last bit of peanut butter, and whack, you've got it. 
most people have no qualms about catching offending small mammals with these things or with the larger version for things like rats and ground squirrels. But if you're disinclined to, these are obviously lethal, if you prefer to deal with them alive and release them in your brother-in-law's garage, or something, <laughs> then there are also live traps designed for the same purpose, either made of sheet metal like the Sherman live traps or wire mesh like tomahawk live traps made up the road here in, uh, in Tomahawk, Wisconsin. Those you can catch the animals alive, but there are a couple of disadvantages. For one thing, you can usually find these two for a buck on sale, a Sherman trap will run anywhere from fifteen to twenty dollars. And for every mouse you can catch in a Sherman trap, I think I can catch five or six in one of these. So these are more efficient and far less expensive. If you're a landowner and you're interested in figuring out what the heck's on your property, what have we been seeing around this rock pile or whatever else, again you can use the snap traps, but in this case catch and release is not an option. So most people use the live traps in that setting, but trail cameras are so sensitive and readily available now that you could set a trail camera, a motion sensitive camera, appropriately over some bait or a log pile or something and usually capture pretty good images even of the tiniest rope. When our students were doing the decomposition studies on deer carcasses for chronic wasting disease research, they had wonderful pictures of shrews sitting in the back of a deer carcass, chewing away on something uh, with the trail camera. So in that case, you capture the images with no impact on the animals at all. But that's just a trailer. Okay? All right. Um, I involved here. I don't mean tricks, meaning that it's deceptive, but it's a matter of having to do your homework to figure out what the diagnostic features are. Some things are pretty easy. So here's a flying squirrel. Is it a northern or a southern? You just look at the belly here. If it's white from tip to base, it's a southern. If it's charcoal gray on the interior portion, the half closest to the skin, it's a northern. These things have switched around a little bit as far as Wisconsin's concerned. A beautiful little animal. Incredible. Would you touch that, please? Tell me how soft it is. Beautiful, isn't it? Very soft. Great big eyes. They're nocturnal. Uh, very soft. All the features. You look at the mole. You look at this thing. If we're alive, you see the big membrane that stretches from foreleg to rear leg, suggesting it can glide. The big rudder-like tail, which it uses for a rudder. Again, and the basic identification shouldn't be difficult. If you go back to some of the original references on mammals in Wisconsin, the gold standard is Jackson, a book from 1959. It shows these things where you might expect them in the southern part of the state and the northern version in the northern part of the state. Well, in the 60 years or so since that book was published, now these things are quite common all the way to Lake Superior and northerns have become very difficult to find. So things change over time. So your reference should be checked out too. More recently, Charlie Long from here on the Stevens Point campus published what he felt was an update of Jackson's book in about 2005, 6, something like that. So that reference is available and is more contemporary than Jackson's book. And then there's scattered. Okay. The, um, the oh God, where to? becoming abundantly clear that once again I'll never get to the PowerPoint. But, you know, <laughs> just a quick, a quick tooth lesson. And I'll use a skull big enough for you to see. Because in the absence of any other issues with these little guys, the teeth tell the tale. And from the skull, from the teeth, and some of these animals, the records that you'll see in our museums and collections are only from skulls and what's the source? Where do you suppose all those skulls are coming from? Who's providing them for us? Owls. Owls. Owls are other raptors that dine on these, not, not these, an owl would be hard to dine on a timber wolf, but 
As far as the small mammals are concerned, you find a good owl tree and it's a good collection of pellets. I mean, it is a common exercise in a high school biology class or the nature center is to dissect an owl pellet. And you might find three or four skulls in each pellet. And then those, with a little bit of effort, can be identified to the species. And some of the records of some of the more unusual animals do come from owl pellets. They're better at finding these things than we are. But armed with the skull, you have to know your way around the dentition a little bit to figure out who it is. So every mammal has what's referred to as a dental formula. So do you. So using your tongue, feel around a little bit up there. And we're bilaterally symmetrical. So left is the same as right, up is the same as down, as far as the human dentition is concerned. So in each one of those quadrants, <coughs> how many incisor teeth do you have? And then the sharp one over here, this one, incisors in the front, the big one, at least on a timber wolf, more or less large as far as humans, that's a what? So it's a canine. So you have one of those. Then how many premolars? The cheek teeth are kind of tricky. It's hard to separate them unless on a skull like this <coughs> there are teeth that are defined as a certain type of tooth. This great big tooth that has an opposing tooth in the lower jaw is by definition the fourth upper premolar. So you can go four, three, two, one, four premolars, two molars. In your case, how many? Two premolars. And then if you have all your molars, including, including your wisdom teeth, three more. So your dental formula is two, one, two, three. Eight right, eight left, 16. Top and bottom, 32. So the human dental formula, 2, 1, 2, 3 equals 32. All of the mammals have a dental formula. 42 teeth, 42 teeth here. In this little guy, this is the one I mentioned, the dark charcoal gray specimen with the long tail and the weird nose. That's a star-nosed mole, 44 teeth. The only mammal in the state with 44 teeth. So if you start counting teeth, you get to 44. There's no question about that. Our aforementioned little baby possum here has the strangest skull. Where did he go? So strange. Oh, here it is. These little guys, as somebody said, they're marsupials. So they have a dental formula different from all others. They have a whole slew of incisor teeth, 18, as opposed to R8. So their dental formula is skewed toward a lot of teeth. They have 50, more than any other mammal. So the bottom line is you, you start to figure out how you can figure out what's what for teeth, where they are in the jaw, and then in the case of herbivorous species or rodents, like this deer, here in a timber wolf the teeth are differentiated. The molars look different than premolars, premolars look different than canines. In the case of the deer, no incisors, no canine, just the cheek teeth. It's almost impossible to separate them, so you simply count up the number of teeth. But you can also see they're all the same. It's just a grinding surface for processing all that vegetative matter that the deer is harvesting. And that's the way it would be within the, basically the dentition of most of these small field rodents. Except the kicker, especially for the voles, is that the tooth patterns are much different than in all sorts of squiggly lines and triangles and closed circles, and figuring that out is a taxonomic nightmare, but it can be done. So when I told you about the owl pellets, and here's some skulls, we'll figure this out. Easier said than done. And the reality is that although I've dealt with some of this stuff for a long time, lots of labs with the students and whatnot, if it came down to identifying some of these things, I'd be going back to the key or the dental formulas, just like anybody else would. You just can't remember it all. But you do have to know enough about the terminology to realize what you're dealing with or up against. There's one other interesting phenomenon with the rodents. This is a woodchuck skull. Uh, what happened there? Lousy oh. orthodontics. <laughs> So the teeth in these guys are small field rodents, or any rodent for that matter, grow continuously. Our teeth are rooted. Once
once you got it, you got it. It's not going to change. But in the case of these things, the incisor teeth grow constantly. And they grow a lot. So if there's a malocclusion, if they don't come together perfectly so the animal can keep them worn down, they just keep growing. And you end up in a situation like that where this one was actually growing around the beginning to penetrate its own skull. It would have starved to death long before this, so I'm, I'm thinking this must have been an animal somebody had captivity and was feeding to see what would happen. Uh, but that's that's the potential. It's kind of bizarre, but it does suggest that those teeth are quite a bit different than ours are. But the reason for that is these rodents have to gnaw constantly, and they have to keep those teeth sharp. If they wore down, like the teeth of a deer, they'd be out of business. So they can stay in tip-top shape by constantly growing teeth. Okay, enough about this stuff. Now, we've got three minutes to cover. <laughs> 116 images. We'll have to go quicker. We'll, just, we'll skip the text and just look at some of these animals. Um, that's fine like that. But there we go. So, I didn't say much about the squirrels. Sometimes the tree squirrels are thrown into the mix red squirrels, gray squirrels, and so forth. That black squirrel is, so let's see the keyboard here. Is that something really weird or different, or is it just a gray squirrel? It's a gray squirrel. It's just a gray squirrel. It's a melanistic gray squirrel, so no problem. There's the gray squirrel. There's the black squirrel. There are several other color faces, too. And for whatever reason, the last, oh, I don't know, 10 or 15 years, especially in northern Wisconsin, there have been all sorts of color combinations popping up. Light bodies, dark tails, dark bodies, light tails, a lot of combinations. But black squirrels are really pretty animals. For whatever reason, they seem more prevalent in the northern part of the state than the south. Fox squirrel, uh, too big for our consideration. Red squirrels, however, would fit our definition. Again, northern coniferous forest species, very noisy. Uh, distinctive in identification, not just the red color, but the white ivory. There's a picture of one. There's our flying squirrel. Uh, as I said, beautiful little animal. Very popular with people if you can get them coming in your bird feeder. Or if your sunflower seeds are all disappearing overnight, these are the likely culprits. But with an appropriate light, usually starting with a red filter, but sometimes that's not necessary. You'll have as much fun watching the flying squirrels as the birds. There's the one that I had the specimen of. You see that bright white belly, and you can see a little hint of the patagium or uh, membrane that allows them to fly. They can't fly. That's a misnomer. where they can only fly from a high point to a low point. Our two chipmunks, looks a little distorted for some reason, but uh, in any event, uh, the eastern chipmunk is the one that was on the board. By, oops, I thought I had a better image. The, uh, the other one, the least chipmunk, which is a northern forested species, is about half the size, and the stripes on the back go all the way down their butt right to the top of their tail. So if you see a little chipmunk around your feeder or your cabin up north and the stripes go all the way to the base of the tail, that's a really unusual animal. These chipmunks are not seen nearly as frequently as the larger ones. The various ground squirrels. 13 liner there, again, lots of names for these things, some of them not very complimentary because they're major garden pests and seed eater, but interesting little things. Surprisingly for rodents, surprisingly carnivorous. Given the opportunity, uh, these things will take nesting birds or um, nest of mice or whatever they can get a hold of. I've even seen them jumping up off the ground and grabbing fledgling birds out of the air. They're kind of flopping Bird. Oh, here's our least chipmunk. So this is the cute little guy I was, I was describing. But you see how the stripes go all the way down to his tail as opposed to fading out on the rock. <coughs> Franklin's ground squirrel become pretty scarce in the state. Uh, people are very interested if you happen to see these things. They look sort of like a gray squirrel, but their back pelage is kind of salt and pepper-like appearance. And the tail, oops, excuse me, and the tail it looks like a kind of a ratty, skinny version of a gray squirrel's tail. They are brown squirrels. They're sometimes in colonies. And if you ever saw these or found any, then 
people are very interested, especially some of the DNR folks in the small mammal survey, are very interested in knowing where they still exist. Woodchuck, too big, there's our pocket gopher. Beaver, too big, muskrat, no, don't want him. Where's our holes? Ah, here we go. So, of the various bowls, of which there are six, this is by far the most numerous, by far the biggest nuisance, and the one that you'll see evidence of maybe as soon as Friday or Saturday, if it does get into the 50s, and the snow melts off your lawn, all the little ridges and trails that you see in your lawn in the spring is the work of these guys. That's just a cosmetic problem. It causes all sorts of anxiety. Where are they? I'm going to get them. I'm going to nuke them. I'm going to do something. Forget about it. They're long gone by then. You can't do anything about it, but the grass will grow back. But these things are incredibly fun. Population estimates in some, they're always in grassy habitats. And in really good habitat, they cycle about one every four years. They're monitored by the Department of Ag and Trade and Consumer Protection as an agricultural pest. I don't know if we're looking at a good year coming up or not, but when they're abundant, there have been densities reported of a thousand or more per acre. So you start to have an animal that, you know, where an acre of ground is one in every area the size of a table probably. They can be incredibly abundant. and the name of this one has changed a little bit. The more appropriate common name now is woodland bowl. These are not very common in Wisconsin. They do a lot more digging in meadow bowls and they cause a lot of root problems, but again, not common in Wisconsin. The prairie bowl looks for all the world like Microtus pensilvanicus, the meadow bowl, except it has a little bit of different coloration and it's an open grass and a prairie species. Redback little thing. They all have the short stubby tails, but this one has a brick red stripe on its back. More of a northern animal and more of an animal found in, as you can see from the stigma moss in this picture, in moist uh, music habitats in the lowland areas, but also very abundant where they are found. <coughs> the southern bog lemon, Synaptomies, is another bowl, and uh, they're a little bit smaller than meadow bowls, more common again in the state, but I guess the easiest way I could describe identifying them is they look like they're having a bad hair day. <laughs> Their hair seems a little longer and shaggier and more ragged. They're not as sleek in appearance as most of the other small mammals, so that's one way to identify these little guys. And then the three mice that I mentioned in the genus Paramiscus all look pretty much the same. And all have taken a lot of heat in the last ten years or so because of transmission, their involvement with four corners disease or hantavirus. There are restriction, uh, restrictions or rules now on handling or working with them in the field. But the bottom line is these are a native field rodent. They belong here in Wisconsin and they're pretty little guys. They're distinctively bicolored and they have very big eyes and big ears. They, they are really cute little animals. Unless they're in your garage. <laughs> but the important thing if you don't know much about mice and you start to, oh, there's some rodents in the house or in the garage, whatever, and you start catching them, and you look at them in their uniform gray, all the way around, with beady little eyes, then that's the house mouse. That's a big problem. These, with bigger eyes and a white belly and feet and the lower portion of their tail, while they may be a nuisance in the garage, they're not that much of a household problem, and it's a seasonal thing. So the implications of catching a mouse is not a mouse, as far as what you might catch in the garage and the implications for your own well-being. And there's a little house mouse in Norway, Iraq. If you want to deal with a small mammal that just has lots of interesting capabilities, then pick Norway rats. Their reproductive potential is incredible. Their physical abilities are incredible. So. All other small rodents pale in comparison to rat, but unfortunately, it's something of a social stigma attached to. If somebody's got rats in their house, it's not something you bring up at a cocktail party.
<laughs> you might say, oh, I saw a big buck in the backyard the other day, but you don't say, yeah, my garden is full of rats. <laughs> so generally, you don't hear very much about these things, although they certainly are around. Well, I've, I've overstayed my welcome here, Larry, but the, uh, the, the, let me try and, try and summarize a little bit. So we've established that there are quite a few of these things out there. They're widely distributed. They're very interesting in their own right. And there's some practical applications from the standpoint of damage and safety and so forth that might suggest that they're worth learning about. Identifying them, while it can be a little tricky, especially, say, within the bowls or amongst the paramiscus uh, field mice, it can be done. There are lots of resources available to help see that it's done. And then beyond that, it's just a matter of getting out there and finding some of them or coming in contact with them and see what's what. So let's, let's see at this point where the question is yes. Apart from there being pests, are they serious disease carriers in any sense? Um, certainly there are disease problems associated with influenza rodents, particularly the rats. We don't have roof rats in Wisconsin, although black rats and roof rats are the ones implicated in plague. We don't have to worry about that, but some parts of the country and the world still do. So, yeah, there are some concerns, but generally speaking, a little common sense and hygiene go along. It's not something that keeps me up at night. Yes, sir. How does a short tail distribute the whole of the white tail mouse? Yeah, white tail mouse. If you are, mice are fast, but shrews are like. They're very, very quick. Uh, they're almost like the weasels of the small mammal world. So uh, whether it's an ambush situation or a pursuit situation or just the two little animals being in the same confined space at the same time, they seem quite capable about finding them. Now, if you're trapping in a garage or an outbuilding using snap traps, you check your traps and all you're finding in the trap is the head or the cape of the offended mouse, mm -hmm. that's because you've got shrews in there too, and they're eating them before you can get those traps. But no problem there. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Yes. I have two questions. The first is uh, how common are gray squirrels with two tails? <laughs> I'm going to have to go with not very common. <laughs> <laughs> So a large gray squirrel, normal color, with a very large, quirky yellow tail, and growing out of the end of the yellow, quirky tail, which overall would have been just a very large gray squirrel, was the second tail. It had a couple inches of uh, no fur, like a rat, and then a small, quirky gray tail. So not too common. You know? <laughs> uh, no, not too common. Nor, nor can I offer up much of an explanation, although usually in a case like that, it's a matter of some type of injury where there's been some regrowth or referring of a damaged tail, and you get some different colored fur coming in. You haven't but seen if, any warning? Nope. Have you seen any? Weird? Nope. Okay. Second question. Will you consider coming back in a year? <laughs> sure, I would come back anytime. Uh, there, there are lots of things in the world of wildlife to talk about uh, beyond small mammals, but you guys will have to come up with what you'd like to hear about. And then I'm sure Larry's become very adept at harassing me with, <laughs> through the internet, so uh, we can figure something out. Yes, sir. Any quick and dirty ways of telling the smaller shoes apart? The pygmy, the arch So the little tiny ones. There are three, and now I'm talking about really little things, no bigger than your little finger. So there are three. There's one with a short tail. That's the least shrew, Cryptotus, a prairie species and very rare now in the southern part of the state. So the short tail, they're no bigger than a bumblebee with a short tail. There are two like this that have a long tail, the mast shrew and the pygmy shrew. Holding them, if I had another one between my index and middle finger, you couldn't tell them apart on visual examination. You 
you have to peel back their lips. And this is where stuff starts to get a little tricky. <laughs> look at, and look at the cheek, teeth and the side of their jaw. And there are diagrams in the shrew keys that will show you how many unit cuspid teeth are visible in the side of the jaw row, either three or five. And for some of the other shrews, it, it, that also is an issue. But you have to look at the teeth to make the call for sure. So here's a jumping mouse, which uh, beautiful, beautiful little things. Their, their pelage is very pretty. It's tricolored, dark on the back, brightly colored sides, and a light belly, and a humongous tail. And a woodland jumping mouse and a metal jumping mouse. Telling them apart is a little tricky, except the woodland has a white tip on the tail. That helps a little bit. But they have an incredible tail and great big back feet. So common name for these, kangaroo mice. Whatever. And they jump like crazy. And they're very fast. Usually all you see of them as you're walking through grassy habitats is something moved, or you might see a jump, and you don't know whether it's a leopard frog or a jumping mouse or what it was. They're hard to catch in the live traps because the tail's so long, it sticks out the door, and they can often get out. Uh, but they are pretty little things. They're reasonably common, but hard to get your Oh, just under the wire. <laughs> yes. How do you keep them out of your car? <laughs> <laughs> you close the doors. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a huge, huge issue. And I if know a lot of newer cars, they came up with some uh, eco-friendly covering for wires made out of soy base. And they love them. You know, they love to eat them. If you're storing a car or even parking it for short periods, especially in the winter when the engine's warm, hey, it's a nice spot, guys. We can get warm in there. But like I said, the rodents have to chew constantly. And there are lots of things in an engine compartment that are good for chewing, <laughs> like wiring. So I stored a federal government Chevy Suburban that I was using during the research project in Hork and Marsh. I left it outside one of the storage buildings for the winter, came back in the spring, oh, the battery must be dead, opened up the hood, there's a muskrat, toes up on the air cleaner, and there was not a shred of hosing, tubing, or wire insulation <laughs> left in that engine. It was a big mess. Uh, so, generally speaking, if you're storing things, you either, you either use something they don't like, like naphthalene flakes, put a couple mesh bags of naphthalene in the housing compartment. Ammonia does the same thing, but it evaporates very quickly. Uh, or put place packs of some of the common rodenticides. In other words, it's a little cellophane pouch, which just sits there until the rodent finds it, chews into it, and eats it. And that will help. And I, I fill my boat with those when I store it for the winter. And those are some of the only options. Do you worry about birds of prey that would take those rodents after that? Most of most of the rodenticides that you and I can buy at the local hardware store or farm and fleet or whatever now are only anticoagulants and the secondary poisoning risk is very low. Uh, some of the stuff that used to be used, like strychnine, for example, the risk is much greater, but you can't get that stuff. And if the Baits are used properly. You can dispose of any animals that you find. There shouldn't be a big problem. Okay, let's call it good.